Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Hello and welcome to episode 79 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. Now, if you're a fan of the podcast, don't forget to check out details of our very first live show in London, Sunday, March the 13th, with two amazing special guests, Gary Crowley and Steve Tufty Carver. Two massive Weller fans and friends. Details on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Now, talking of friends and fans of Paul, my latest guest on this episode of the podcast is a hugely successful writer, DJ, broadcaster, host of the modcast, producer, manager, festival curator, scooter rider. Heck, is there anything he can't do? It's acid jazz record label boss, Eddie Piller. We're going to dive into his love of the jam, through to the Style Council, Weller Solo, fanzines, gigs, a music video, acid jazz records, the infamous King Truman Project, yes, and a friendship with Paul. Let's get into it. Eddie Piller, thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. This is going to be a real blast. There is so much for us to talk about in terms of your love kicking off with the jam, the Style Council, Mr. Weller, your career, your fanzines, your music. I don't know where to start, quite frankly. This is going to be massive. So I'm really excited about chatting with you. I'm glad we got it sorted finally. So thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. So where do you want to start? I want to start with chicken pox. Was it chicken pox that introduced you to the punk scene? It's a great way to start. (laughs) I wanted to be an actor. I got the lead in the school play just before the school play started. I got chicken pox. My mother's mate worked at EMI and she bought around a box of records because I had to stay at home for three weeks as a 14 year old. So I passed puberty and chicken pox wasn't great, to be honest, if you've um, arrived at that particular point in your life. And um, this lady bought around a box of promos. And to be honest, they were stuff that I was used to listening to, like the Rolling Stones, Queen, Elton John, all that kind of stuff. But in it was a Power Exchange 45 single. There was about 50 records. I was getting into music, but I wanted to be an actor. And I just heard this single, which was I'm Stranded by the Saints, which had come out six months previous on Power Station, I think was the name of the label. It was an EMI subsidiary. And I heard this record and that was it. Changed my life. And what was it about that music that kicked in with you? I'm, I'm guessing it was a thing about you're finally finding music for your generation in a way. I mean, I'd heard punk, you know, and I like the Stranglers and I like, you know, the top of the pops type punk that you had, of which I just regarded the jam as just another one of those punk bands, you know. But when I heard this record, which was I'm Stranded by the Saints, it really moved me and spoke to me. So from that point on, I ditched everything else in my life, including my favourite subject, cricket. i played a couple of games for the Essex under 14 side and I thought I might make it as a cricketer and then acting, I wanted to be an actor and then I heard the Saints and that was it. So I got rid of everything else in my life and just embraced and followed music, which started with the Saints and the Damned and 999 and the Clash of the Jam, the Sex Pistols. But then after I saw the Jam, you know, at the music machine sometime later, uh, I realised that there was more to punk than just idiots that looked like Sid Vicious and Sniff Blue outside my local station. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, saw, I saw the Buzzcocks, I saw Generation X, I saw the Damned, and I thought, hey, this is my kind of punk. You know, I don't like the kids that like the clash down the King's Road with a dog on a piece of string, having their photo taken tourists wearing 300 pound bondage trousers. I didn't, that wasn't me. So, you know, when I saw Buzzcocks first, which was in April, 1978, and I just thought, this is what I want to do. And, you know, they were a mod band, basically. I don't care what anyone says, you know, the Mondrian block, print shirts, the tonic suits, the modernist artwork and the angular chords of of the first Buzzcocks album were just incredible. And I just embraced music through through Buzzcocks. And I, I got to see all the punk bands, you know, 
and I, I loved all the punk bands, but I didn't like punks, you know. I made a little punky outfit at school and I used to wear it to gigs and that, but then I saw the jam and I knew I could just be what I wanted to be, which turned out to be a mod, you know. Yeah. But it took me a while to join the dots between the jam and mods because my mum had been a mod and my dad had been a mod in the 60s, but it was a different kind of mod. My mum did the Small Faces fan club. My dad was a Lambretta riding jazzer who called himself a modernist in the late 50s. So it took me a while to join the dots between what I was seeing on stage and what I wanted to be. And I think the jam helped me join those dots. So that's how my life and work in music began. Oh. So you're right, pin it on chicken pot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm right in thinking your dad told you you got completely the wrong end of the stick about mod. Didn't he say you'd you completely have, missed the point? You have done your research, haven't you? I was on the way to school in probably April 1979. He was giving me a lift to school. And I put on a tape, he goes, what's this rubbish? And I said, oh, it's mods, Dad. And he said, do you think that's mods? No, no, I don't know what you think mod is, but it's not this. Mod is Tubby Hayes and, you know, mod is mod jazz and scooters, not wearing a parka without a scooter and listening to what I can only regard as rubbish so that <laughs> certainly made me think about i obviously at the time i thought god what does he know he's a silly old git but of course he was right it, but it took me five six years to actually work out that he was right because yeah. but he was right you know mod was more but the thing is mod was punk and it was the cause of the purple hearts the secret affair but it also was tubby hayes and art blakey and sidewinder and you know giant samba and all that jazz that we came to love the thing about mod is it's whatever you want it to be and i, I was going to say so presumably it's different things to different people and it, it might be different to you as it is to different to paul presumably you kind of have your own interpretation of what it means to you do you well ironically i think funny enough paul is probably one of the few people that does have the same interpretation as me when he split the jam up in december 1982 we thought well, that'll be the end of the mod revival then. But of course it wasn't because he showed a different path, a different way of accessing what we thought about was mod through the Star Council. You know, I thought he was finished with mod. But in fact, what he thought was mod was more than this, than the jam. And, you know, I, he told me he was reading um, Colin McGuinness, Absolute Beginners or City of Spades, one of the two. And he said, no, I can't do it anymore. I've got to embrace what I really feel which was what mod really was. It wasn't kids walking about parkers, although that was part of it. It was so much more than that. And, you know, Paul Weller eloquated it perfectly. Yeah, I've heard him talk about and talk to you about this, um, being quite dismissive in a way of, at times, of that jam legacy. And the most recent interview when you had him on the Modcast, he, you could see he kind of gone full circle was now embracing that and understanding what it meant to people. But at one point, that sea of green parkers, he was quite dismissive of that, wasn't it? You know, obviously I've known Paul since 1980. And he was very... Although in 78, 79, he wasn't dismissive of the mod revival. He was absolutely the person that gave the breaks to the chords and so they got the Purple Hearts record deals by introducing them to them. And, you know, he was massively part of it. I think he realised, oh my God, what have I done? You know, I didn't want this. This is like when Frankenstein finally realises that the monster he's created has cognitive thought and isn't going to do exactly what he wants. I think that's when Paul went, oh, hold on a minute. By 1980, I think Paul was dismissive of the mod revival, but he was never dismissive of young mods. You know, the first time I met Paul properly, you know, I met him at gigs because the jam did this funny thing. Nobody ever done it before. I was talking to Rick Buckler about it only last week. You know, they had this thing, you know, where they just opened the back doors to gigs when they were doing sound checks, you know, and you get two, 300 people in there and the band would come and say, hello, where are you from? It's like the Queen. And what do you do? <laughs> it was like that but it meant so much to a 15 year old who probably wasn't going to get into the gig so I met Paul at these kind of open door events and I met Rick and I met even Bruce but I only came to know Paul when I got the chance to interview him I did a co-fanzine interview with a chap called Ray Margotson from a fanzine called Patriotic and, and we were both trying to interview Paul in 1980 for our fanzines and Paul said we might as well come and do it together and you can both write about what you want and that's when I got to actually meet Paul and I think by this time he was being dismissive of the modern Bible but never of the kids that had embraced the way of life that he created it's a real difficult he must have been in a real dilemma you know I don't want 
people walking about dressing like me and copying me. But on the other hand, I've created them. So I feel a responsibility to kind of look after them, show them the way, if you like. It's a strange thing. But I've always equated it with Ron L. Hubbard, the inventor of Scientology. He had a bet with a friend of his that he could make a religion from scratch. And he got it right. You know, Scientology is an enormous religion that makes an enormous amount of money for people who follow it. There's certain actors, John Travolta, various other actors that are obsessed with Scientology. It's made up. Now, if Paul Weller had said, I'm going to make up a religion and make people follow me and do what I say, and I'm going to be the same. He couldn't have gone about it in a better way. But I know that he didn't intend that to happen, but it happened. And you were one of those followers for quite a while in terms of the jam. How many gigs did you get to see? It was over 50, wasn't it? I saw them 53. My God, you really, you do do research. So yeah, I, saw the jam, yeah. I saw the jam 52 times. I saw John's Boys once. And I think I saw them under another name. But I've never quite managed to work it out. I might have to. I'm going out for Christmas dinner with Rick. I don't know when you're broadcasting it, but I'm going out for Rick. Buckler's birthday Christmas dinner because he's born very near Christmas and I might ask him because there is some debate whether John's Boys did two gigs one at the Marquee one at the Nashville or they did one just one at the Marquee and I also remember going to see the Eton Rifles which we always thought was going to be the jam and I don't think anybody turned up so I think that might have been a time where they thought let's do a secret gig and change their mind so in total I think I saw the jam 53 times and how did you know John's Boys? Where did that come about? How did you know that was going to be a thing that was going to be the I mean, you work it out. Of? Come on. Where did you see it advertised? How did you hear it about it? It was just in the, it was in the list, in the gig listing. The thing about 1979, 1980 was if you were a mod, you could go and see a mod band, any different mod band, 20 times a week. And that, they used to play in places like the Marquee, the Bull and Gate, the Dublin Castle, the Rock On. I mean, anywhere. So we kind of trawled Sounds and the Enemy, the small ads, looking for where our bands were going to play. Beggar, The Mon, The Scooters, you know, The Notre Dame Hall, The Fulham Greyhound, The Red Cow. I was 15 years old and, you know, you saw John's Boys playing the Nashville and you thought, what, John's Boys? Come on, who's that going to be? <laughs> so we went and sure enough, I mean Crowley was a mate of mine quite early doors and he was a good friend of Paul's, very early on, you know, if we wanted to confirm anything, you know, we'd get hold of Crowley. But in those days, you didn't have mobile phones. In fact, a lot of people didn't have phones. So you'd have to use phone boxes to phone people's houses and then they weren't there and their mum said they'd give them a message and they didn't. And so it was very hard to get older people. So in the end, you just used to bump into them walking about in Soho, you know, after work or after school. Now, you mentioned fanzines. So this was something, this was a passion from a very young age. When you were like 16, starting out a fanzine. And these things don't really exist these days because everything's, I suppose it's the equivalent of a blog, isn't it, that's online these days. Yeah. You were publishing these things at like a really young age and first of all, selling out but not publishing very many, just printing off a few copies and so on but then you're selling thousands of these things aren't you well in the end it became a job you know i mean see what happened i was quite lucky because i was involved in the mod the mod revival as it's called from a very young early age and i was younger than most of the other people i was at school with dave cash from secret affair so so i knew about the mod revival quite early and i was encouraged by a guy called goffer gladding who used to run maximum speed and another couple of guys called tony lord and vaughn to lose now vaughn had a different life later he signed for paul weller's respond label and made a couple of fickle public speaking i think was his big single but anyway vaughn and tony were like mod heroes to me. They were like a couple of years older, as was Goffer Glad. And they were both kind of running their fanzines down towards the end of 79. And there were a few other fanzines around. A guy younger than me called Dominic Kenny, who, who ran a fanzine called Shake. There was Direction Reaction Creation, Patriotic and Roadrunner started at the same time as me. So I found myself the kind of first and the second wave of post-79 fanzines with a lot of support and access to the bands because I've been following the bands around since, you know, late 78. But I was kind of shy and kind of nervous. And I didn't, I know it sounds strange now, but I was. <laughs> and I, I, the first fanzine I did didn't have any interviews. Extraordinary Sensations, number one. It was like 12 pages and I sold 20 copies at the Bridge House. But I had 
done any interviews. And then I realised that, you know, Vaughan and Tony Lord in particular were very encouraging. Come on, you've got to do this. You've got to get on with this. Interview people. Get someone famous like Paul in it. You know, all this kind of stuff. So I gradually got more confidence and I started off by interviewing Tony Perfect from Long Tall Shorty. He was the first interview I did. Then I think I did the team beats, black called Huggy Lieber, who faked his own death, by the way. It's another story. Um, and then I think Steve Merritt, my mum, said, wow. why don't you give Steve a ring? You know, because obviously I knew Steve when I was five, I think was the last time I saw him. And I remember going to see him. He got the small faces back together in late 79, I think it was, at the Bridge House. Ronnie Lane was too poorly. I think he managed three numbers. Ian McLagan was in America, so they had Zoot money on organ. So Terry Rawlins took me down to meet Steve Marriott. And I'll never forget, you know, I said, you might, hello, Steve. He goes, well, why should I, who are you? I said, oh, you might know my mum. You know, Fran Pillar, she did your fan club. And he, he took a step out, let me forget this, and said, fuck me, you're Ronnie Lane's son. And I kind of was bewildered at 15, 16, maybe just 16, going, uh, what do you mean? And then he burst out laughing, saying it was only a joke. For those three seconds, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> my mother was having sex with Ronnie Lane and I was his son <laughs> anyway, so so I gradually got more confidence and then you know I, I went to Paul and Paul was absolutely you know they might have been just 81 by then I think he was recording not Setting Sons the other one the one after that Sound Effects um, yeah, I think it was recording sound effects, but he gave us, you know, half a day where we, you know, just could just hang out at Solid Bond, me and Ray. And, you know, I, I remember trying to dress my best mod clothes. When you consider everything that Paul did for our world, I mean, it was extraordinary that he would, I mean, probably it was still 1980, actually, but it was incredible that he would give his time to a couple of 16 year olds. You know, he's already having chart records and, mm. you know, he's in the middle of recording an album. But I remember Adrian Thrills telling me exactly the same thing from 48 Thrills. Paul and Bruce helped him staple up during the actual takes of In the Crowd, which I just thought was like, Fuck me, if he's got time to let them do, you know, Paul's contribution to my life can never be underestimated. And it's not just his music, it's his leadership and direction and his taste. Well, and what were you doing? Were you, did you have a little tape recorder? Were you scribbling down notes in a notebook and then step, going, going home with a typewriter, right. typing it up? How did it work? It, it was one of those kind of six inch by eight inch cassette players that oh. you could get at the time with batteries. God knows where the tape is now. I don't, th I think Ray kept it actually. I don't think I ever saw it again. And ironically, I don't think Ray gave me the transcript after the interview. We were going to split it in half. I remember it coming out in Patriotic Fanzine. I don't remember me actually doing it. It might be because I haven't looked at my fanzine for, you know, 40 years. But I, I, I'm not so sure I actually did put put the interview out which would have been a waste obviously but it wasn't a waste to me did you go to every gig of the final tour was that right I think I missed two I think but I, <laughs> I certainly went to most of them but I mean what we used to do there was me and a girl called Simone Lynch and this started when I was 15 years old Simone's dad was a coach driver a self-employed coach driver who had a 52 seat coach so you know I said to Simone she was one of the Woodford mods like me wonderful girl we were both still at school. And I said, can you have a word with your dad and see if we can get him to drive us somewhere cool to see the jam? So, you know, I can't remember who I spoke to, but it might have been Nikki Weller. said, look, can you get us 50 tickets for Brighton or for whatever it was? And she did. And so we sold, I think the tickets were three quid each. The bus ticket was an extra three quid each. So for 50 of us, all under the age of 17, would go on Simone's dad's coach to see the jam. And it started off in places like Bristol or, you know, I don't know, Warwick, places like that. But after a while, everyone's going, well, let's go to Holland. Let's go to France. So we do these completely unauthorised jam tours, uh, just the Woodford Mods, 50 of us all, you know, but our parents would let us go because Simone's dad was there. So they all thought, oh, that'll make you all right. God, if they knew the fights, the drugs, everything else we got up to. We still weren't even 16. I mean, God knows how we got away with it. But, you know, it was just an incredible time. I remember before the famous jam, jam trips, there'd, there'd only really been that famous trip to Paris, with which organised by Grant Fleming at maximum speed, and they all went on a train. But we decided to go to... No, the first time I went to see them in Amsterdam, I went on something called the Magic Bus, which was a kind of 
post hippie kind of leftover coach journey from Victoria to Amsterdam, which cost fifteen pounds return plus the ferry, which was about another four quid. I was sixteen. I went on my own and slept in my parka in a doorway in Holland. I mean, you know, come on, can you imagine this kind of crap now? We started going all over. Europe, but I mean mainly. I've got to be honest. Belgium, France, and Holland. Holland was the best because right? there were loads of Dutch mods, and they made us really welcome. And I'll never forget the first time we took our coach to Amsterdam. Some great photos of it. Rick got on the bus and, and after the gig, he said, "What the hell are you lot doing here?" And we said, "Well, you know, we're 16 years old." And he's like, "But how come your parents let you come?" And it's like, I think everybody had said, "Well, I'm staying around my mate's house tonight." It was kind of a bit like that. <laughs> so, so that was my jam life, and that's why I saw them so many times. They took over everything. I had Saturday jobs and holiday jobs, which I used for records and gigs. And that, but bear in mind, you could go to a gig for 50p. So we're not, you know, I was getting 32, 38 quid a week working in a mod clothes shop called Mr. Byrights in Ilford and you know that would cover the whole summer's worth of you know gigs to records Brilliant I love it I love it and presumably when the jam called it a day when Paul calls it a day with the jam you must have been gutted but the style council was really quick and I know you love the style council we'll have to dig into that now but how upset were you when the jam called it a day? Well the front cover of Extraordinary Sensations 14 I think was the bitterest pill I ever had to swallow with a picture of Paul's little head that was a very big seller by the way <laughs> and it might have been number 12 by then we were selling at least Terry Rawlings had joined me and we were selling at least a couple of thousand an issue but I was taking them on the road with the journey so you know I'd go to Liverpool King's Court Theatre I'd sold 300, you know, and all the smaller gigs like the Chords, Secret Fair, Purple Hearts, and Bratters, all those. The truth, even by 83, we were selling a few, good few thousand. When the germ split, I was mortified and I thought, as I said earlier, I thought that was the end of our scene, but it wasn't. You know, I didn't know what Paul had up his sleeve. I didn't know Paul well enough to phone up and say, what are you doing? Someone someone gave us his number, it might have been Crowley. We phoned him up for the interview and his mum asked the phone. I said, oh, yeah, I'll be home later. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, phone. I'm like, what? Can you imagine that now? Phoning up someone like, I don't know, someone like Robbie Williams and going, excuse me, um, he's moving back for tea. Can I? I mean, you know, that it was a different time and a different world. And I'm very happy that I grew up when I did. And also, I guess the age as well, because Paul was a very young man as well. It's not like he was, you know, it's not like he was, you know, 10 years older than you. You're all very close in age, weren't you, obviously? Paul is four years older than me. But weirdly, the Purple Hearts, you know, who Paul was very good to when they started, they're a year older than me. And I was 15 the first time I saw them at the Notre Dame Hall in, in Leicester Square. So can you imagine this scene? Unlike the punk scene, where a lot of the bands, like the Lurkers, were you're 20, 15 years older. That seemed so ancient in their 30s. But our bands were the same age as our fans, and us. And we were so young. You know, I've got so many friends that I was still, I was friends with then, who, you know, are the same age as me. There was no Svengali's. There was no managers. There was only the Jam and the John Weller. No other bands had managers, apart from maybe the Lambrettas. But you could tell because they soon had pop hits. But all the rest of the bands were just like us. You know, yeah. it's, it's very hard to be a pretentious twat when you are the same age as your fan base, you know? And this Style Council immediately connected. There was a big passion there. And we should talk, you mentioned Gary Crowley a couple of times. We should talk about the video as well. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so this was, um, what was it? Solid Bond, wasn't it? Solid Bond in Your Heart, recorded at um, Woking Football Club and Crowley rings you up and gets you you involved gets you along there as part of the part of this disco <laughs> well all it was was Gary phoned me up at this time I was running probably London the home county's biggest mod club we were going through a period of kind of rare soul music you know because we started off with revival music punk rock and you know and by kind of early 83 which is when the Style Council made the first couple of releases we discovered the concept of swain heads of reggae Rare Soul and Gary Funk, Gary had DJed for me at, at this club called the Regency Suite, which which we were doing. And he phoned me up and said, Look, Paul's looking for some suede heads. Now I knew what suede heads were, but not many other people did at the time. Because I, I was obsessed with any youth culture that stemmed from mod, I was completely obsessed with. And suede heads, obviously, you know, you had the original skinheads who were just mod with short hair, and then you had suede heads, then you had smoothies, and then you had boot boys, and then you had bonnets, you know, which the whole beautiful skinhead scenario collapsed with these Nazi twats with shaving heads and toes on. 
on their faces. Gary rang up and said, do you know any swing hits? So I said, well, not really, but we could do it. Because we've all got winter paint check shirts and fair old yoke jumpers and braces and brogues. So we did. And we went down. They got a coach. They were, Paul got a coach from his local pub in somewhere in Mayfair, which is near where he was living at the time. Not too far. But I wouldn't go on the coach because I just got myself a Lancia Spider at the age of 19. So I drove my Lancia Spider behind the coach with four lads in it, with the roof down. And uh, we just had the best time. And so I appreciate that. And that is possibly the first time I became slightly famous to those in that video. Although I don't regard it as famous because I was actually better friend of Mick Talbot because I used to go and see the Matt Parkers. And, you know, I knew Mick's brother Danny quite well and his little brother Steve. <laughs> Sorry. I was just laughing the whole day. Basically, the director, whose name escapes me. Tim Pope. Tim Pope goes, you, who's your girlfriend? Get her over here. So my girlfriend, Michelle, who now lives in Italy, by the way, beautiful girl. <laughs> she had, because I said everyone's got a dress in Sweden. She had this three-quarter length tonic jacket on, but she kind of had big hair, slightly Essex hair. Didn't have a suede or a skinhead girl haircut, but she had the right jacket on. So Tim Pope said, you and that girl there. Come over here. So I get called over and he goes, right, this is your girlfriend. Yes. Um, Michelle Absalom. That's it. And she moved to Italy soon after, but she was a lovely, beautiful girl. And uh, Tim Pope goes, Mick Talbot is going to nick your girlfriend. And then you're going to get really angry. And you're going to push it. And then it's going to be a bit of argy-bargy. And then Mick's going to walk off and we're going to film him kissing her outside. So I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this, but okay, we'll give it a go. <laughs> so after the third take of my wooden acting, the director goes, cut, get that fucking idiot in the blue suit out of cut now. Get rid of him. Get him out. So instead of my glorious acting part where I push Mick and go, oi, what do you think you're doing, mate? It's just you just see me doing a tiny bit of dancing. Then Mick outside with my laughing girlfriend who can't keep a straight face. Oh, I didn't realise that she was the girl that Mick's meant to be pulling outside. Well, he can't. Yeah, but they cut out the whole scene because I wasn't a good enough actor. <laughs> and even though I wanted to be an actor and so all you saw was the end of it where kind of she walks away from Mick trying to go I don't like you but she's laughing and I think they tried to film it so many times they just gave up and I just went I'll just go with that fuck it oh that's so funny yeah Mick goes back dancing with Paul at the end of it doesn't he yeah, <laughs> right <laughs> It was, oh a, it was a great day, but my favourite bit about that day, and I've been told since by other people this didn't happen, but I know it did, is that the opening scene where Paul comes down the hill on the Lambretta and Mick gets out of the Mark 1 Paul Cortina, they filmed that five or six times and the director kept going, no, do it again. So by the end of it, Paul just got off the bike and let it crash into the side of the car so he didn't have to do it again. <laughs> I remember that. People said, no, it never happened. No, it did happen. I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> You're right, it just gets off and it just carries on, doesn't it? It just carries on. But people go, no, that never happened. No, no, Paul would never have done that with a Lambretta and a Cortina. He did. <laughs> Nikki Weller was at an event the other week and she said that um, Paul is pretty pretty crap at riding the, either the Vestas or the Lambretta. He's not, he's not good at it. It's one thing he's not he's not managed to get, get yeah, it off. Paul phoned me up in tears of joy about a year ago going, you're not going to believe it. What? I've passed my scooter test. <laughs> at the age of what? 63, he passed his scooter test. Well done, Granddad. <laughs> I passed mine at the age of 17, thanks to Paul Weller, funnily enough, because I would never have been a mod otherwise, so I would ah. never have got a scooter. Got no, but I don't mean to call him granddad. I just imply that he, obviously anyone who's not very good at taking a scooter test, you know, it's like setting the video recorder in advance. You know that kind of thing that your name could never quite do? Yeah, yeah. You clip the start or the end, <laughs> miss half the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder how many times he's, he's tried and failed. This is fascinating. Oh, he never told me, but I mean, the fact that he was, and I actually, funnily enough, another name drop, I went out with Suggs about a month ago and he said has he has he passed it yet <laughs> and I said yeah Paul phoned me about three years ago and goes just before lockdown he goes right me you and Suggs are going to go out for a ride on our scooters so when I saw Suggs and I said oh Paul wants to go out for a ride as soon as this lockdown thing's over and he goes uh, he hasn't passed his test yet has he I said no I think he has Suggs Suggs has Suggs is Suggs is a top mod he's one of my favourite mods he's still a mod now actually as is Paul well enough. Oh, he's going to love that. He's going to love you chucking that out into the public. Right, we should talk about records. We should talk about your record labels. We should talk about how you got into, uh, I mean, this love of music, this DJing. We talked about mod. Tell me about how you suddenly become a record boss. So how does that come about? Well, in 81, I started managing a local R&B band called Fast Eddie. They were playing at our clubs that we were putting on. I was DJing. We were doing all day as at the Alpha Palais for mods, but we were too, me and Mappy and Ray and another guy called Dean Port, we were too young to 
signed the contract because the Ilford Palais was the top rank and they, you needed to be over 18. So my dad was signing the contracts and we started doing the Ilford Palais all day. And we got doing this because there was all dayers for months, but they were run by 50 year old guys and we were 17. You know, who's going to tell us about Mod? You know, not you, Granddad. Uh, you know, I think it was a guy called Andy, Andy Rue and a few others, you know. And, you know, we just said we could do this. So my dad hired the venue. We had to pay it, though. We put on all dayers. And to try and build this up, I'd always wanted to work in a record company. Jackie Kirby from The Who, her, her husband Bill was The Who's manager. And I grew up with their kids, you know, bizarrely, Jackie and... Jackie and Mick Kirby, her son, they were both mods from Woodford and Chigwell. Jackie Kirby kept trying to get me jobs in record companies, and I never quite got one at that time. So I thought, right, I'm going to put out my own record. And just as I was recording Fast Eddie, I'd got a job at an independent record label called Avatar. I think it might have been six months before I did the Fast Eddie single. But I asked the guy at work, how do I make my band more famous? And he said, make a record. And I was working at a record label, and I realised I didn't know how to make a record. So this old fella called Mike Thorne, who I think originally originally signed David Bowie to RCA. He taught me how to make a record. So I made one with Fast Eddie. And suddenly, things started to take off. It's easy to make a record, or it was at the time. It's not easy now, because yeah. there aren't many vinyl pressing plants anymore. But it used to be, you'd send a check for 100 quid to an advert at the back of the enemy or sounds, and you'd get a 1,000 records back. You know, it was that, that easy to make records. In fact, it's probably not 100 quid, it's probably 60 quid. So, you know, that's how I started there. And obviously, after a while, I left Avatar, went up, I went out on my own, got employed by Stiff to run Countdown Records, which was a mod label. Then when Stiff went bankrupt, I carried on until eventually in 1987, I met a guy called Giles Peterson. I'd already been managing the James Taylor Quartet for a while, who came out of the ashes of the prisoners. And I met the James, I met Charles Peterson. And after a while, we said, let's set up a record label. What should we call it? We couldn't think. A DJ called Chris Banks says, why don't you call it S and Jazz? So we did. And then the whole scene came out of a very small club scene of 100 odd people who went to Dean Wilson and the Mag Club. And ironically, Paul Weller, who had, you know, the Style Council had been detained by Polydor for a couple of years over modernism. You know, Polydor wouldn't let him go but wouldn't release the record, et cetera, et cetera. And Paul used to come, and Mick used to come to the Acid Jazz Clubs because Paul saw it as an extension of mod, of what he was trying to do. Because we were playing early Acid House, we were playing funk, soul, R&B, boogaloo, disco, but as mods. So I think Paul saw what we were doing and, and embraced our scene. And then it was only a matter of months before he decided to make a Style Council record under a false name for Acid Jazz, which yeah. was King Truman, you know. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. Actually, Chris Bangs, there's a connection with Weller there as well, isn't there? Didn't he produce Above the Clouds? Is that right? I think he produced a couple of Weller albums, actually. Bangsy was the man that invented Acid Jazz. He's, he's an absolute genius. And I've just re-signed him to Acid Jazz after 35 years. Brilliant. Because yeah, he left to become a professional producer. And uh, he made an album with Mick Talbot, Bangs and Talbot. And uh, we just signed it. So it's coming out on Acid Jazz, which is fabulous, because I love it. And I love... Chris Burks. That is exciting. That is exciting. It's fair to say this thing takes off and goes, you know, astronomic with bands like or acts like Jamiroquai. I never understand. It's a bit like Villagers because Jamiroquai to me is JK, but obviously Jamiroquai is a band. But really, all you think about is JK, right? Galliano, Mother Earth. Yeah, you know, it's really, really successful, isn't it? Thirty bands. At least 30 bands. After nine months, Giles Peterson left and we split the company in half. He got the Young Disciples and Galliano and I got the brand new heavies and a man called Adam. A man called Adam went on to be left field, probably the biggest of all the yeah. dance bands. They were great. They were great. Uh, and the brand new heavies, obviously, well, they had several platinum albums under my tutelage. So, uh, you know, we did pretty well. Giles had talking loud, I had acid jazz, but it was like a bit like the Beatles and Stones. Acid jazz talking loud. Jerez Rez, Ben and Ballard. Specials Madness. It was this kind of constant, we're better than them, they're better than us. So it was a great time for us to release records. You know, we had hundreds of hit records and we sold millions of records. And of course, and then in 92, I met JK and the rest, you know, I mean, 42 million records he sold. That's even more than Paul. <laughs> Fun enough. Nuts, isn't it? And didn't you try to sign Paul at one point, so I suggest? Paul was 
going to be signed. I'd agree to deal with John. But, I mean, Paul, it was bizarre. Paul couldn't get any interest. I think he'd had a long documented fight with Polydor over the end of the Star Council. And he couldn't really get signed afterwards. I think in the end they negotiated and were allowed to leave. And so I came up with an idea to sign Paul. We were getting a deal together, but I had the idea of a label, which I've always been independent. I never went to a major, but I was going to go to London Records because I had a really good relationship with Roger Ames at London because they had the brand new heavies and I'd given them lots of hit records. So I said to Roger Ames, I'm going to take Acid Jazz, more professional, but I need to make it part of Polygram. So what I want, a label with Jamiroquai, the James Taylor Water, the brand new heavies, Paul Weller, Terry Callum. I want those five bands. And Roger Ames said, I'll do it, but I won't do it with Paul Weller. And I said, why? And he said, because he's finished. And I said, I said, you're wrong. So I ref- I turned down the deal. I wouldn't do it because I was so thought that anyone who thought that Paul's career was finished was an idiot. And then look what happened. All right, Paul Weller movement. I know Paul, you know, I think it's his best solo album, to be honest. I think it's a, that's the one I would have released because that's what we were talking about. While he was making it, we were talking about me putting out that record on us, Jazz. But to me, it's a work of absolute genius. But the fact that Paul, you know, was worried himself that he wasn't, you know, what's happened after 15 years at the top, you know, British music, suddenly he's playing at 300 people, you know, and he's like, am I finished? You know, and he said this in the podcast, and I didn't realise how much it affected him. But then for him to come back with Worldwood and go to all those people at the establishment, fuck you, look at this, listen to this. It was such a brilliant time, you know, that time where Paul, Paul's rebirth, because there's no doubt those first three or four, they're still making great records now, but, you know, he was worried with the Paul Weller movement, but the next two or three records just proved him right for following his own ideas, you know, and nobody believed him. But I did, a lot, at least I think I did, because I certainly wanted to sign it. But the fact that people are saying now he's done, he's finished, he's all washed up, that's the end of the career. And he's silly. What is he? Early thirties at that point, isn't he? Oh yeah. Can I mean he's what four years older than me? And at the peak of acid jazz in what eighty eight. I'm 25, you know, so he's yeah. like, not he's, yet 30. Yeah, he's I done. Mean, he's finished. On. I mean, come on, man. Christ. Yeah, that's mental. And <laughs> and even when you think about like songs like on Wildwood, like has my fire really gone out? Those kind of things are off the back of those feelings, aren't they? It's, it's, it's they time. must be, you know. I mean, here's the thing about Paul, right? For many years, Paul didn't like talking about what he's done. Even today, he doesn't like looking backwards. You know yourself from, from his sets over the years, he doesn't like moving backwards. He likes moving forwards. And so consequently, he's never really been one to talk about his past. And yet, in the last three or four years, I detect that he's very happy within himself because he's now talking about, you know, can you imagine him? I asked for years to be able to write a Style Council documentary and he said no. You know, and then he lets Crowley do it. How dare he? <laughs> However, you know, the point being, Paul is now much more comfortable in his own skin. So he can look backwards and he can, you know, maybe analyse his decisions. Mm. Now, you mentioned King Truman. So this was 1988. Well, uh, Mick Talbot, DC Lee, Carleen Anderson. And this is what's known as now as probably the rarest record by the Style Council called Like a Gun. It was an acid jazz release, but then, what was it, days before it was due to be in the shops, due to be out, Polydor make you scrap it. Yeah, there was a chap, nasty little man, an editor of a magazine called Soul Underground, and he'd reviewed a man called Adam, who I mentioned earlier, and he said, what a bunch of wankers, they're rubbish. They'll never be anything. And then we had a number one in the club chart. So I wrote him a letter in those days, you had to write letters, where I told him exactly what I thought of it. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So then he called up David Munns at Polygram and said, you're not going to lie to this, but the Star Council releasing a fake record under a false name with Acid Jones. So I was pretty cross. I was working for Polydor at the time for Urban Records as a consultant for their black music label called Urban. I've done a few compilations. I've product managed some singles. I'm in a meeting. I get a, the boss and they are all glass windows. Uh, David Munns comes, knocks on the window, points at me, come here. So I go out. He gets me up against the window, puts, and he's a bit of a bruiser, but, and he puts his elbow in my throat, and he goes, what the fuck have you done? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about, boss. And he goes, clear your fucking desk. And I said, what have I done? He goes, you put out a record by the Star Council. You've interfered. I've been working on a settlement with the Star Council for two years, and you've gone and put a record out. Clear your desk. You're sacked. And I said, but I haven't got a desk. I'm a consultant. And he went, get out of my fucking sight. And uh, Polydor sued us. They seized the records from 
our distribution company. Now, about 200 copies got out. We don't know how many got out. We've tried to work this out with Ian Munn. We can't quite work out. We think a box of white labels, which is about 25 white labels, which had a photocopy press release, maybe as many as 200 got out. But here's the interesting thing. I was not aware that this was a collector's item until 2003. I'd given it no thought whatsoever because it's just another record. I'd released kind of 200 records in Acid Jazz. It was just another one of those records. And then I got a call at the office in about 2003 from Italy, from a guy going, uh, excuse me, do you have any copies of Jazz in 9T? And I thought, well, what's that? I don't know what it is. And then Stahl comes well, why, why would you want that King Trevor record? So I did a bit research and I discovered they're selling for like 78 quid. And I thought, hold on a minute, have I got any of these? I had three copies. Anyway, and then I saw in the small ads in Mojo for sale 300 quid for uh, like a gun. And I just thought, this is quite out of control. I spoke to Paul. We decided we would never reissue it. So the original copies were still original and it became actual releases on a record label. I think this was one of the rarest. That's incredible. Love it. Now we should, I'm, I'm aware of time. So I wanted a couple of other things I want to ask you about is let's talk podcasting because you're on here, the Paul Weller fan podcast, but you're a proper pro at this. So you started what, 10, 10, 11 years ago, the modcast started, not just a podcast, but live events. End of March, we've got the spring boat party. And then this summer, July, the modcast goes overseas. That's one thing I love, actually. You're always thinking about the extra bit. What other value can I extract from this or can I give to the fans and stuff? So talk me through the modcast. Where did that idea come about from? I'd always wanted, because when podcasting became fashionable, I always thought, hmm, there's, you know, modcast, podcast, modcast. It just makes sense. I'd been interviewing people for a job on various different radio stations over the years. Um, I've been a broadcaster for like 30 years. Started on Jazz FM. I've been at BBC Radio London, BBC Radio 6 Music, done documentaries for Radio 2. I've written documentaries for television. So I just thought, wouldn't it be good? And it started off as a roundtable chat show with five or six guests a time, but it got to be too much. So over the last few years, I've tended to just have it as a, as a kind of a one-to-one interview program. Even just recently, I had Andy Lewis, Paul Weller's solo bass player for many years. Nine years, I think he was in the Paul Weller band. I just, it's something I enjoy doing. And so we would do, we decided to do some boat trips. They sold out. We decided to do, you know, some all-nighters, some all-dayers, some bank holiday things. And they all seemed to do extraordinarily well. And we built up a kind of a family of people that all know each other that, that come to our events. It's a wonderful thing, and it's probably the best, most enjoyable thing I've done. But we're going to Mallorca for a week, which should be fun. Loads of mods in Mallorca. We've got a company that owns 50 Cervetta Lambrettas, and they're, we're having a day out. There's lots of uh, day trips. So we're doing a day on Lambrettas. We're doing a day scuba diving for anyone who's PADI qualified. We've got a day in a vineyard, uh, wine tasting. You know, it's kind of the kind of things that people just like to do on holiday with their mates. So, but we're trying to just give something that everybody can enjoy. So you don't have to go vineyarding. You don't have to go scuba diving. You don't have to go to Lambretta. But, you know, there'll be swimming pools and there'll be beach parties and there'll be all-nighters. And it'll just, there's 25 DJs. It's just going to be fantastic. That sounds amazing. And the criteria is what? You have to be a mod. Is there a, is there a, no. mod, is there a mod test that you have to do? No. no, you don't have to be a mod at all. In fact, what we've been doing over the years is taking house DJs who were mods before Acid House and taking them back to their roots. People like Rocky and Diesel, two of the biggest house DJs you know, from that period, they DJ for us. They played classic 60s soul, Northern soul, two-step. Uh, a guy called Dave Jarvis from the Faith Junior Boys Own setup. You know, he, he does it. Bonds to stay at mind, I think. I've always thought, but well, it's obvious. And uh, yeah, we're hidden, right? And um, you, I mean, you love DJing as well. And I've, I've read that this is kind of your first love is DJing. And you've, you've played for some pretty big stars of so people like um, Pele's birthday, Paul McCartney's birthday. <laughs> if you so, don't so, well, it's Sir Paul. Sir Paul. I, I, I called him Macca on a podcast previously, and I had people had a right go at me for that. <laughs> I, for some reason, I am seen to be regarded as a safe pair of hands from for old celebrities' birthday parties. I've done Ray Charles' 70th. I've done Sylvester Stallone's 40th many years ago in Hollywood. That was wow. a party. <laughs> uh, I've done Pele. I've done Paul McCartney. But Paul Weller's 50th has to be one of the best because I'm telling you, the best thing. Oh, my God, I just remembered. So Roger Daltrey walks through the door just as I'm playing I'm the Face by the High Numbers. <laughs> and he's with a friend of mine who's his PA, Angie. And he, say, he turns to Angie and speaks to her. And I go, I'm running up to her afterwards going, what did he say? And she he said, he said, God, we were good then. I just think that's the 
fantastic instinct. <laughs> so I love the high numbers. I love the who, you know. But my favourite thing is a DJ. It's writing. Now, I've written 11 documentaries on telly, two on radio. I've written a drama series that got cancelled because of COVID, unfortunately. It would have been shooting now about Soho. That was set in the 60s. I've written a couple of books and I've got my autobiography out next year. So I'm quite a busy, man. What is it you love about that process? Is it the research? Is it digging into the history or telling stories? Telling stories. It's all out of my head. I don't bother doing any research. <laughs> Stop that. It's too much like hard work, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Just make it up. If you don't know it, make it up. Now, I mentioned the podcast. Finally, you got Paul on. It took a while though, right? I mean, when was this? this was 20... I, I didn't have the bottle to ask him. I, was I didn't, <laughs> didn't have the bottle to ask him because I knew he wouldn't do it. And yeah. then, you know, he was out a few times drinking with Smiler Anderson. Not drinking, obviously, because Paul stopped drinking. But Smiler, just, you know, if you're out with Paul on Tuesday, just say, would you come on the podcast? And he went, yeah, sure. I'm like, what? <laughs> I try to interview him about mods hundreds of times. And he, you know... He does, but he does now. That's the thing. It was really interesting because there were a few times where he kind of pointed you on to Smiler and kind of went, come on, I want to hear, I'm only here to hear Smiler's stories. I want to hear him being interviewed. <laughs> well, that was that was how I got Paul, actually, by because I know he loves Smiler's book about mod. What's it called? The New Religion. That's Paul's favourite book about mod ever. So I did persuade Smiler to rope him in. But, you know, when Paul kept trying to turn the attention away from him. But let's be honest, Smiler's been on it loads of times. Come on, Paul. Everyone <laughs> wants to hear what you've got to say. And he did. It worked. It was brilliant. I have to say, there's a couple of bits I'll just pick out quickly, if that's all right. One was his love of the seven inch still. And the the fact that he said it was his, still his favourite format is that seven inch single, which I thought was brilliant. I think everybody's favourite format, you know, is so much more immediate than an album. You can imagine the album came to the fore in the 60s. You know, before that, it was all about 78. Bang, here's your, here's your thing. Put it on, dance to it, you know? And, and you can understand why the the album gave rise to the concept of prog because you could tell a story. Before that, people never told stories through records. You told little little vignettes, you know, like a three-minute thing about, I love her, she hates me, I don't love her, I want to beat him up. You know, but there was no story. And then suddenly you've got people telling, you know, these amazing musical journeys that take him from A to Z. So I understand what he means. Seven Inch is immediate. Yeah. And I don't mean Andrew Lou Goldham's label. <laughs> and then the other thing that was really interesting was the fact that he felt let down by his 60s heroes, he talks about, when he was like 16, 17, and he kind of had this view of, I don't want to be like that. You know, I know why, I know what happens to make that an unpalatable situation. And to be honest, I don't blame him. You know, I think he got on well with Marriott. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not 100% certain because obviously Steve died tragically young. But, um, you know, I've met a lot of my heroes. I hate loads of them. Right? You get people like Paul Weller and people like Steve Merritt who are not wankers. So let's just leave it at that. <laughs> right. Two final things before you go. I have to ask you about yeah. Totally totally Wired Radio, this really cool thing. Um, there's a bunch of people I know who have been on the podcast who are on it as well. Tell me about that and how people can find it and how they can find you on there. Well, it's an internet radio station. I was on Soho Radio for uh, two and a half years, uh, which was a great internet radio station. But I kind of, I realized I'd had my day and I wanted to move on. So I stopped doing it. And I got a phone call from the chief executive of Fred Perry going, look, why don't you do radio? I used to listen to your show every week in my office. And I said, well, I just got bored of it. And he goes, but wouldn't you like to run your own radio station? And I thought, no. Oh, hold on a minute. Yeah. Why not? And so Fred Perry paid for everything. They built us a studio. They bought all the equipment. They paid for staff. They got the whole thing off the ground. And then COVID hit, which was really unfortunate because we only been going six months. But what it did do was it increased the listenership exponentially. I mean, massively. So in the space of you know, the year of COVID, I know it's been a year and a half, but in the first year of COVID, our listenership went up incredibly. And we had listeners by the second lockdown, we had listeners in 96% of all countries in the world. The only countries that we didn't have listeners in were ones controlled by China, because China prevents access to internet radio in case you say that President Xi Jinping is a murdering bastard. So they don't allow you to broadcast in Chinese controlled territories like Tibet. But we were broadcasting in countries that I'd never heard of. And I'm quite good at geography. I, there was a country in the, in the West Indies 
It's got three names to it, and I've never heard of it before. And yet, I discovered we have four listeners <laughs> in that in that country. It's been a wonderful thing. It's given me the opportunity to work with so many great people. I do every Thursday afternoon UK time at four o'clock. I do my own show, which is called the Eclectic Soul Show, which I've done on various stations now for over twenty two years, and people still like it. You know, I get lots of listeners from all over the world. And the other thing is, I do the podcast every Tuesday. But you can get all of our shows on Mixcloud.com. Well, how do you distribute your podcast, by the way? It goes everywhere and anywhere now. So it's on Podbean, but you basically pick it up on Apple and Spotify and Amazon Echo. And Well, we used to be on iTunes. And then when I moved from Soul Radio, we stopped doing iTunes. And I think that's kind of difficult. So we're going to go back and expand the reach of the podcast, I think, during the new year. And then we have to talk about this other piece of massive, massive news, Acid Jazz Records. It would be remiss of me not to mention this. There's the Style Council connection, the Weller connection, obviously, the signing... D.C. Lee. Tell me how the hell this has come about. Well, I worked with Dee in 1993. I've known Dee since we were kids, actually. And I worked with her when she sung on Jessie by Mother Earth. And I just thought she has the most beautiful voice. The thing I like about Dee's voice is the vibrato. It's a very unusual long vibrato. Now, if you know anything about singing technically, a long vibrato is quite difficult. A vibrato is where, for the uninitiated, your voice wobbles. And it's quite difficult to control it the way that Dee does. She's got very long vibrato, I would call it. She's got great timing. So we saw her bumped into her somewhere. And I said, you know, I'd love to carry on working with you and make another record. She went, God, that was a long time ago, nearly 30 years ago. And I said, yeah, but you've still got a great voice. So, you know, we're working. I've heard some of the demos for the album. They're fantastic. Oh, exciting stuff, man. That's so exciting. I think it might even have been a very deep scene from the Style Council documentary. Yeah. I think that might have given me the idea to give her a ring. You know, I think I bumped into her somewhere just after seeing that. You know, and everyone who was in that film had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that you wouldn't tell anyone that Style Council got back together. We were terrified about letting it out the bag, but nobody was allowed to know. Paul was very specific about that, so we didn't tell anyone. And then when you heard it... Yeah, that was such a special, I mean, an emotional moment, but such a special moment, seeing the four of them back yeah. together, wasn't it? I mean, God, wow. Incredible. So, and in terms of timings, is it pretty relaxed? Is it just when it's done, it's done? Or have but you got a specific yeah, window for it? I, we're aiming for the autumn. You know, she's only just started going into the studio, but I've heard two or three of the first tracks. They're incredible. Wow. Well, I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hopefully Dee will come on the podcast to plug it as well, you know. But um, yeah, I'm really excited about that as, a, as are all fans. And then finally, we should talk about what you've got in terms of new stuff from you, because you love putting these compilations together which are all really exciting for us as well so last year I think it was we had the Mod Revival one we've had the stuff with Martin Freeman you're working on something new at the minute aren't you? Well I'm working on loads of, I mean I'm always coming up with rubbish ideas but we've got a new Martin Freeman Jazz in the Corner 3 me and Martin have done that one and I'm doing British Mod Sounds and 60s a 6 LP vinyl box set on the 100 seminal not all of them. You know, licensing problems with university, you can't get all of them. I'm really proud of that. I'm following that up in a year's time. Free Beat and Psych. It's called Down the Rabbit Hole. British Free Beat and Psych of the post-mod period. And that'll be another six-volume LP box set. And I also think that uh, Eddie Pillar Presents and Modern Revival did so well, they've asked me to do a second volume of that as well. So you never know. There were hundreds and hundreds of Modern Revival bands. Oh, don't forget, it was all over the world, the Modern Revival. The Bangles, for example. You know, Walk Like an Egyptian? Yeah. They started out as an all-girl American mod band called The Bangles. You know, there are bands from all over the world that were mod revival bands. And, you know, the second volume will definitely have more international feel to it. You know, we had mod bands in the charts in Spain and Italy and Germany and America. In fact, no doubt had a bit of mod about them when they started. A lot of people don't know the history of the American mod scene. There's so much more to come. So we have two final questions for you, um, Ed, on the podcast. Sure. You're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the Jam, the Style Council or Solo. What are you going to go with? Ball Rush is outside my window. Oh, nobody's picked that yet. But oh my of course God. they haven't. What of course they shame. haven't. What a shame. I'm a genius. That's why. <laughs> Into Magic Bus, right? I was, oh God, I was sitting backstage at Paul's 50th next to Roger Daltrey and we're chatting away about Peter of Mead. He goes, excuse me, I think I've got to go on stage. And he walked out and sang Magic Bus. And I was sitting, I walked with him, got to the side of the stage. The last thing I'm going to say is, I'm backstage, Paul's mum comes up to me, the lovely Anna, and goes, uh, right, Ed, 
Paul comes off stage to smoke a fag halfway through the set. Yes. Well, you've got to go out and sing Happy Birthday. You've got to lead the 6,000 crowd at the Brixton Academy into Happy Birthday. I goes, what? 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 You want me to what? Kenny Wheeler goes, if you do that, I can guarantee you, it'll come on stage and punch you. You're not to do it. And Weller's going, if you don't do it, you're never coming to see my son's band again. Kenny Wheeler's going, I'm not going to allow you to do it. And I'm going, what do I do? Paul comes off for a phone. I sneak back around the other side of the stage, get on the right phone and say, I think you know it's, it's somebody special's birthday today, isn't it? And we're all going to see it. Paul Weller can't kick me up the arse. <laughs> it was very funny, but I did lead 6,000 people in a happy birthday for Paul. There you go. Wow. Right, final question. The purpose of this podcast is not least to meet amazing people like yourself who have got a love of Weller's music, who've got connections with Paul and stuff. But it's also for me to get an interview with Paul Weller, the one that I never managed during my radio career. I gave up radio 10 years ago with that one big regret. If it happens, Ed, what should I ask him? How good was it being interviewed by Eddie Pillar? <laughs> Highlight the career, right? Well, come on. I mean, it took me 40 years since my first interview. The second one took me to get back on. So good luck with that, Dan. Come on. (laughs) What, What should you ask him? Any regrets? Oh, good one. Good one. Eddie, this has been such a blast. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really, really appreciate it. No worries, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed myself. Well, there you go. My thanks once again to Eddie Pillar. So many amazing stories and surprises in that episode as well. I feel that Paul's going to love some of those. Brilliant. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please do share on your social media channels. It really does help to spread the word. You can get in touch on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook Paul Weller Fan Podcast. If you head to my website, you can find more information on Eddie. There's links to those albums that we talked about, his books, and you can even listen to the King Truman track as well. Plus all those Modcast events that we mentioned too. Just head over there, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. You can even buy me a virtual coffee if you fancy it too. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.